keeping you from beer. So I know that's a, a sacred position. Sorry about that. So I'm going to talk to you about Gia and uh, what we call securing a post Snowden world and explain exactly what that, that means. This really started a, a, oh, so me. You've seen me before. Uh, so in case you're not up on current events, basically we do uh, technology, we do planning for the operating system, uh, planning for system center, et cetera, joint planning. And the way we do this is we have three streams of planning. One stream of planning is the business. Where's the market? Where are the startups? What's going on? Uh, where's the money? Uh, then we have the voice of the customer. Hey, what are our customers telling us? What are their problems? What do they want, et cetera? And then we have technology planning. And I own the technology planning for the operating system and system center. And so part of that, my job is to look out there and see what's happening in the world and then figure out what things we should do about it, technology, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, a, a few years ago, I started to see some things that disturbed me in the area of security. I mean, you saw it all, you know, Chinese hackers getting into systems, et cetera. And I, so I came to a few conclusions. First was um, that the bad guys were actually getting better faster than we were getting, right? So we've been on this path of trustworthy computing. Uh, that's a real thing. That's not a marketing thing. Uh, we have incredible investments in this. It's a top priority for all the things we do. If there's a, a trade-off between security and, and a feature, security almost always wins. It's, we take it very, very seriously. But I just saw that the bad guys were getting very, very good. And I kind of got the, you know, came to the conclusion that a number of things we were doing were modeled after a threat uh, that existed in the early uh, 2000s as opposed to a modern threat. Now about this modern threat, what we became aware of, apparently it was there all the time, was the introduction of these nation state actors with unlimited budgets to find flaws in the system and then exploit it. Now, as I went and discussed this with some of the senior leaders, some people would say, hey, you know, don't worry about the NSA. They're not a problem. Or other people would say, oh, you know, hey, if the NSA is after you, there's nothing we can do to protect you. And I came to the conclusion that this was the wrong way to think about it, that these nation states were using their huge budgets to find flaws, but these were real flaws in the system. They really exist. And it was just a matter of time between, before um, the non-nation states, the really bad guys, were using exactly the same techniques to attack our systems. And then just a matter of time before the script kiddies were using the same techniques. Okay, so these three things, you know, so if you're not on, on current events, you know, there's a tsunami of bad stuff coming our way. And so this led us to a new initiative, uh, we call it the Assurance Initiative. Uh, it was a cross-company initiative to really up our game in the area of security. And so I'm going to talk about that, a little portion of that. This is the GEO work. Um, well, there's many more things that we'll talk about at TechEd. Uh, but really, is this is not kind of point-in-time thinking. There's no silver bullet thinking here. This is really a, hey, we need to start the next wave of our trustworthy computing initiative. 10 plus year journey uh, that's going to take a lot. And one of the big differences was kind of a shift in focus. In the past, we were very, very focused, almost potentially exclusively focused in on protect the platform, protect the platform, protect the platform. I will tell you that we will continue to focus on that, and we have some major new investments in that. But we also have a, a different approach, and that different approach is to say, assume breach. Assume that there's been a breach. Now what do we do about that? How do we detect the breach? How do we manage the breach? How do we, how do we help uh, uh, remediate the situation? Okay, so, oh, I guess that's what I told you. Uh, it's cross-company planning, no silver bullet thinking, assume breach, and GIA is really just one of the elements of that uh, assurance initiative. Okay, so how many people are familiar with this guy? Michael Hayden. Okay, so Michael Hayden uh, was a four-star general. He was the director of the NSA. He was also the director of the CIA. And he was the director of national intelligence. Now, is there anybody in this room that has assets more worth protecting, more important to protect than this guy? Yeah, I don't think so. Now, by the way, the, the first time I gave this talk was to a group of, 
of Microsoft Technical Fellows, and I posed it a little differently. I said, is there anybody in this room who thinks they're smarter than this guy? <laughs> Turns out it was the wrong audience to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> they were all convinced, of course I'm smarter than that guy. And uh, in fact, one of the guys like, no, I know that guy. We're all smarter than he is. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was just the wrong, got it off in the wrong track. Anyway, this guy has assets that are very, very, very important to protect. Okay? Now let's bring another character into play. Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden, 30 year college, 30 year old college dropout. Gentlemen to your corners. Okay, let's see how this battle works out. Now it turns out Michael Hayden went and made a decision that each of us make every single day. It was a decision that was one of the most impactful decisions he ever, ever made. And I guarantee you, he didn't give it a second thought. He couldn't have given it a second thought because he couldn't do his job without doing that. And that decision was, oh, good Lord. Oh, wrong text. Okay, <laughs> he told this guy, you're an admin on my system. And that was the worst decision he ever made. He was pwned. And why is that? And that's because the admins have the keys to the kingdom. Okay, admins can do everything. And there's some actually nice black text there that's, or white text there that you can't read. Anyway, so now in, in, in just pure irony, one of the documents Edward Snowden released was an NSA document. I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. The title was, I Hunt and Hack System Admins. Okay, so the NSA is hunting and hacking you. You, why? They don't think you're messing around with Al-Qaeda, well, maybe you, but they don't think you're messing around with Al-Qaeda, <laughs> right? But what they said was, uh, they, they don't think that people are doing anything bad, but rather, by hacking the people, they, those people have access to all the systems. So by getting the person, they get all the systems. In fact, one of the security professionals said, yeah, um, the, the kids go after the systems, the pros go after the people. Because you get the people, you get their credentials, you get all the systems, okay? So, here's the key observation, right? That admins are part of the attack surface. Now, Lee earlier mentioned the threat modeling, right? So the threat modeling is where you sit down and you say, hey, what are my assets? What are the threat vectors? What am I gonna do about that? And when often when we think about the, the attack surface, I mean, we're trained to think in terms of network access, physical access, you know, what are the ports? How do I set up firewall rules, et cetera? Uh, but we have, don't often think about the admins you people as part of the attack surface, okay? But you are. In fact, you're a very critical part of the attack surface. So GIA is really all about reducing the risk of administrators. And notice the key word here is reducing, not eliminating, okay? So wouldn't it be great if uh, people didn't have to have admin privileges to do their job, yeah? Wouldn't it be great if when, this says if, that's incorrect. When a machine gets cracked, it doesn't link high value credentials. So what's going there on there is that when you, oh, by the way, how many people have ever heard of hash the pass, pass the hash? Right, how many of you have read and implemented the pass the hash mitigations? That's the problem, okay, mm -hmm. that's the problem. So here's what happens. You're an admin, you log on to the system to do some stuff, your credentials get Cached. No, you're a bad guy. You crack that machine, you run a tool like Mimicats, uh, and you're able to harvest all those credentials. You then use those credentials to access other machines that you then install Mimicats on, harvest those credentials, and you spider your way through the network, gathering all these credentials, cracking all these systems, putting back doors in. It's a mess to remediate, okay? It's a real mess to remediate. Anyway, so wouldn't it be great if when a machine got cracked, and again, that's because we're assuming a breach is gonna happen. When a machine gets cracked, that it doesn't uh, yield these high value credentials. Wouldn't it be great if people could only, do, could only do the things that they needed to do to accomplish a task? And lastly, wouldn't it be great if all admins got actions were logged so you knew exactly who did what when? Okay, well that's what GIA is all about, okay? So, now we're gonna, this is talk's gonna be a little variation from the, I've given this talk a number of times, 
you're the power fill guy, so I'm going to go a little more into detail about how we do things. Now, GIA is in fact an experimental toolkit using PowerShell to accomplish these four things that I mentioned. Okay, so how are we going to do it? Well, <clears throat> wouldn't it be great if people didn't have to have admin privs to do the jobs? PowerShell has, have run, has a run as endpoint. Okay, a run as endpoint says when you connect to do PowerShell remoting, <clears throat> you're connecting to a name, a default name. But there can be multiple names. We call these configurations. Each associated, associated with each configuration, there's a name. It has an access control list. It has a startup script, and it has, and it can optionally have run as credentials. So wouldn't it be great if or what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, you don't have admin privileges. You're just a regular user. You're going to connect to this endpoint, and then you're going to run as a, a account that does have admin privileges. Okay. So that's how we're going to accomplish that. The next is, hey, wouldn't it be great if a machine, when a machine got cracked, it doesn't leak high value creds? <laughs> well, what we're going to do with this uh, run as is we're going to create and use a local admin account. Okay, so when we set up these endpoints, I'm going to create an account, I'm going to put it in the local administrator's account, and that's the account that you're going to use. So that when that machine gets cracked, you know, it first it takes admin privileges to harvest the credentials. When they harvest the credentials, what are they going to get? They're going to get local admin credentials, which means that they get nothing. Okay. <coughs> now later we'll talk about how there's a certain set of things you can do this way, and there's a bunch of things that you can't do this way. So in those environments, you'll use domain credentials or managed service account. However, those machines, you'll see you want to be very restrictive with those machines. You want to have a very small number of them. You want to watch them very, very carefully. You'll want to make sure those machines don't get cracked. The same way you want to make sure that your AD machines, domain controllers, don't get cracked. Okay? But this, the idea is we're going to put this on all of our servers. So wouldn't it be great if people could only do the things that they needed to do? So how are we going to do that? And the answer is we're going to use a constrained endpoint. So I mentioned to you that these configurations can have a startup script. In that startup script, I'm going to show you how you can constrain what people can do. You can do these things and not those things, and how you can actually form a security layer if you do it incorrectly. If you don't do it correctly, you will have false security. You will think you're constraining someone, but you're not. So it's very important that you learn exactly how to do that correctly. And then lastly, oh sorry, and uh, part of that is the idea of proxy commandlet generation. So how many people are familiar with proxies, PowerShell proxies? Okay, pretty good number. So in PowerShell, you'll see how we can control everything. We own the parser. And because we own the parser, uh, we have the ability to programmatically um, create proxies for commandlets, and those proxies can then control what things get done. We'll see the details of that. And then lastly, wouldn't it be great if all admin actions got logged? Uh, we've had PowerShell uh, logging, if module logging, for quite some time. I forget what version, version 1 or 2. Uh, but you'll see in PowerShell version 5, we've made a number of improvements. Lee mentioned some of them, but there were in fact more. So these are the techniques that we're going to use to accomplish the tasks. Okay, so let's start with our scenario. I hired this young admin, Eddie, seems like a pretty bright guy. I got my server here and my treasure, all my secrets, all my good stuff. So Ed tries to connect to this machine using PowerShell and he, it fails and says, no, you can't do that, talk to your supervisor. <laughs> so in comes our hero and he says, hey Jeffrey, I need to be an admin on this to, to restart SQL. And then I say, no, Eddie, you don't need to be an admin. Just use, just use GIA and connect to the maintenance endpoint. Okay? So now he does an enter PS session to that server, but he specifies a, a maintenance configuration endpoint. He's able to log in. He's able to restart SQL. Good days. Right? Happiness. And then when he tries to steal the secrets, he gets a great formed error message saying he's not authorized to steal secrets. Uh, this is then be, be uh, logged. The hero here would look at those logs occasionally and then send, send Eddie off in, in handcuffs. Okay, so 
just enough admin. Um, they have a, a number of very simple concepts. The first is this notion of a GIA toolkit. So a GIA toolkit, it's a, a toolkit. Think about like a plumber's toolkit versus a carpenter's toolkit versus an electrician's toolkit. You know, open up those three boxes and they have a different set of tools and it's all the tools necessary to do the task at hand. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create these GIA toolkits that are a well-defined set of commands that support activities, right? So uh, software maintenance versus SQL maintenance, okay? Um, if I have to manage SQL, there's a whole set of things like do, we, do you need to add a user to manage SQL? No. Uh, SharePoint, oh, okay, I'm going to manage SharePoint. I need to be able to create sites and stuff. But should you be able to read the documents? I mean, that was the heart of the Snowden problem, right? And he was a SharePoint admin, so he's doing all this great SharePoint stuff. And being a, a SharePoint admin, he was able to read the documents. Why should you be able to read the documents? That makes no sense. He didn't need to read the documents. So it's a well-defined set of commands to support activities. Then we'll set up this endpoint. This endpoint is a managed connection point that allows authorized users. Remember I said that there was an ACL. So we'll have an ACL. Doesn't let anybody in. You still have to support the ACL. You know, pass the ACL. But authorized users are then going to be provisioned to uh, have access to a set of toolkits that are then going to run as this GIA endpoint account. And the endpoint account is this managed account. Basically what's going to happen is when I set this up, I'm going to see, oh, a new endpoint. I'm going to create a, a user with that name, GSA, in front of it. I'm going to give them a very long random password, and then I'm going to manage, use those credentials to have the, the uh, add them to the domain, sorry, add him to the local admin group, and then use those credentials for the run as credentials. And then what I'll do is I'll update that, those credentials on a regular basis, update the password on a regular basis. And then to make this all work, um, you'll see that what's critical is that it has to be simple. Okay? Uh, originally, this started off, I had like eight or nine concepts. Uh, and then when I, went, I talked to the security people, they're like, oh, that's wonderful. Fine grain control. This is great, great, great. And then, in fact, I'm working with MSIT. Those are the guys who run Microsoft's IT um, shop. <coughs> I'm working with them to actually manage our internal file servers using GIA. And when I told them the exactly the same story, they're like, yeah, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> uh, so security that isn't deployed isn't security. Okay? So it has to be deployed, which means it has to address the, the real-world operational needs of the IT organization. And one of those critical needs is simplicity. It has to be very, very simple. So I went from like eight concepts down to these three. The fact of the matter is you only really need to know the first two, the second one, the third one's for you guys. And in fact, I come to the conclusion recently that I'm going to get it down to one, right? That for, you know, using the 80-20 rule, I'm going to specify an endpoint that it does most of, things, most of the things that you want to do. And then for the more advanced cases, I'll introduce this idea of a toolkit. But the whole focus is on simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. And part of simplicity is, Okay, I'm going to have this. How the heck am I going to make it so? And of course, desired state configuration is the key technology there. Desired state configuration really simplifies the ability to define things and then make it so. So, anybody recognize this? This is a blast container, right? This is what the bomb squad, they see a suspicious object, they take it, they put it in there, and they blow it up. And why? And the answer is you can have a pretty bad explosion in there and it contains the blast, okay? So that's the cognitive model you want to have when you think about these things. And that's what this GIA endpoint does, right? The GIA endpoint account is it puts the server in a blast container, which is to say that because I do things with the local admin account, if when that machine gets cracked, they're able to exploit that machine, but they're not able to harvest any of the high-value credentials because we're not using high-value credentials. Now again, at some point, there's only so many things you can do with a local admin account. Many things you're going to require a domain account. Currently, the toolkit doesn't support that. It will. But when it does, it's very important that you realize now all of a sudden you have no blast container. 
right? That when the machine, if you're using a machine that has an endpoint that uses a domain account, if that machine gets cracked, that domain account can then be used wherever that domain account can be used. And by definition, you're using it because it can be used other places. So you're going to want to treat that very, very specially, put it on a small set of machines, and then watch them very carefully. That's the concept. So here's how desired state configuration works uh, and how it simplifies things. So we have our configuration keyword. If you recall um, uh, the configure from Steve Morowski, this defines something that gets run. Okay? And it's a mixture of imperative and declarative code. And so now what we do is we say for each node in get file servers. Now what's get file servers? And the answer it is that's a function you will write to declare what your file servers are. You can use look things up in SQL, you can look it up in a SQL database. In the MSIT example, we're starting off with a small um, a prototype environment. And uh, what we're doing is I just have a, a file, an ASCII text file that I cat. And then as we add new servers, I just put it to that file. And that's pretty simple, does fine for now. But uh, what you'll do then is now define this node. And here we set up the GIA toolkit. We give it a name, and we give it a command specs. So what this is saying is this toolkit has all the commands from storage and SMB share. Those are the only tools you can run. Then I set up an endpoint, storage admin. I specify a toolkit. Now, if I wanted to, I could specify many toolkits. So the idea is that you can factor these toolkits. You might want to have like a navigation toolkit uh, that lots of people can use, uh, maybe a toolkit to do some very safe system administration stuff like get services and, and get processes. Uh, so you might want to factor those out and then say storage toolkits and general tools. Here I've got a, a security descriptor. Now again, that defines a function. This runs the function. This will now run this, and you'll create a MOF document for each one of the servers that your function get file servers returns. And then what you'll do is you'll say make it so. And you do that by saying start DSC configuration. You give it the file server directory. That specifies where to get all the MOFs. And then for computer name, we'll use the same thing. Oh, this should be file servers. Attention to that. So this needs to match that. Okay? And it's as simple as that. And with this one simple document, what you've now done is you have on all your file servers set up an endpoint that allows whoever can access this to come in, access this endpoint called storage tools, and when we get there, all they can do are these commandlets and they run as local admin. So pretty simple, very, very, very powerful. Now, of course, um, what you want to do is because one of the great things about desired state configuration is this nice mixture of imperative and declarative programming. Okay, so here uh, I'll explain how the, the the command specs work and then how you can use that in desired state configuration. In fact, uh, the command spec is a comma separated value file or string, that's it, okay? So, turns out we've got a pretty good authoring tool for CSV files, and that's called Excel. And so here what I'm showing is how you can use some of the capabilities of the toolkit. So here what we're specifying is, I got a command name stop process, and I'm gonna say that all it can do is stop things by name, and the only things it can stop are calc and notepad, okay? So I'm gonna create a proxy. Instead of saying you can stop any command, any process, I'm going to say you can stop processes, not by ID, not by process, but only by name. And the only values you can give are calc and notepad. Here, I'm specifying that you, you can stop a service. You can only stop it by name. But here, I'll use a regular expression. I'll say they have to start with SQL. So you can only stop the SQL uh, services. This line, line four, says, hey, I'm going to give access to all the Hyper-V commandlets. Right? So this is kind of an incoherent toolkit. But I just want to give you a flavor for the, the sort of expressions you can have. So this says, uh, on the Hyper-V commands, I can give all of them. Or if I could have said get-star. So you can use wildcard to specify which commands. 
And then having said, oh, all the commandlets for Hyper-V are exposed, I then can refine that by saying for the Hyper-V commandlets that have a, are associated with VM, they can only take a name that starts with SQL. <coughs> so you can define pretty rich set of proxies. Now having defined this and created a CSV file, the way you take advantage of that is you get a GIA toolkit, SQL maintenance, the command specs, all you now have to do is cat that file. So again, you can see the power of the authoring model, very rich, and the power of desired state configuration to take advantage of this nice, hey, I do something over here and I take advantage of it over there. Okay, let's do a demo. Okay, so this is my first demo. I got a configuration demo one. I've imported my XGIA resource and I've got a toolkit What's that? No, that's right. Okay. <laughs> um, and what it does is it has get process, it has get service, it has stop process that can only stop things by name, that can be calc or notepad, and it can restart services whose names start with A. So let's start notepad, let's start calc, and let's connect. You see, I've already connect. I've already created the session here, so now we're just going to connect. Okay, so there. Now I type get command, and what you're going to see is you're going to see these commands, but you're going to see a few more commands. And the reason for that is uh, they, I've gone and created a set of safe functions that are necessary to allow you an interactive environment and. Um, yeah, and, and, but they're safe. So we do the get command, oh, get command, and you'll see the get process, get service, but here I've got format, I've got group, got restart service, restart service, etc. So let's see if this actually worked, right? Let's do the acid test. So we'll first do stop process minus ID zero. Yay. Good. Turns out, you know, that's just horrible. Hold on a second. Dollar PS. Oh, well, what do I mean? This, what this says, I'll fix this in a second. What this says is um, a parameter cannot be found that matches parameter name ID. This is not a security check. I've created a proxy that doesn't even have a parameter ID. Okay? So there's no way you can specify an ID here. Now let's kill it by name. Name, LSASS. It says, nope. It says, LSASS does not belong to the set calc or notepad. Okay? So all I'm able to do is to notice, and by the way, I don't know if you notice this, when I specified this, it brings up IntelliSense and says, hey, here are the two values you can stop. You can stop calc or notepad. So we'll do <coughs> calc, and we'll do verbose. And we'll say, yeah, go ahead and kill that and voila, we killed that process, okay? Um, there you go, that's what I want to show. Now, here's another one. Try and change the error number, error, error color, but I can't remember how to do that. Host private data. Okay, dollar sign host. Uh, <laughs> and then error background color. Back now, what the kind? What the error? Sure Foreground color <laughs> equals. <laughs> That's worse. <laughs> Yellow background color. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, great. All right, let me just steal that a couple other places here. My other run spaces. Yeah, it's good enough. Okay, so so here's my second uh, my second. God damn. My second run space. And what it does is it's got a toolkit, SMB get. 
and what I've specified is its name is SMB get and it's SMB share get star. Okay, so my endpoint was demo two. Now first, just so you see this in focus, if I say get command uh, SMB share, you'll see, oh sorry, get command minus module SMB share. There's a lot of commandlets here, right? Update, mm. unblock, set, you know, close, blah, blah, blah. But here, I said all they can get are the SMB shares. They can only do the getters. So when I say get command, you'll see I only get the I only get the getters. Said another way, I'll say get SMB, and you see that they're only the the getters. Now notice, by the way, the module is the SMB get toolkit. Okay, over here. The module was SMB share. So in fact, what's happening is I'm dynamically creating a module for that specification. That module has proxies to the original commandlets, and those are the only ones that I'm all allowed to author. Now notice in this environment, I've only allowed them things like you know these get SMB shares, right? Notice what I didn't allow them. Print working directory. Nope. CD C colon temp. Nope, uh, dir. Nope, can't do any of that. So maybe you look at that and say, well, it's, you know, you sort of, those are sort of important to, to allow somebody to do storage management. So here, I've created an environment. And what I've done is I've gone and made those functions available, right? So you see, you get, get child item, get item, all that. So now those are all available. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Oh, sorry, that's pretty straightforward. Print working directory, cdc colon temp, dir, copy zzz dot tx. Oh, let's get rid of this one. Delete. Sorry, remove item. Z. Dir. Okay, great. Copy zzz dot txt to. Let's do it again. New. All right, looks good. So then let's cat that. It says no. Get content is not recognized as a legitimate commandlet. So I've created an environment where you can do all the file management, right? You can CD, you can catch, you can copy files, you can delete files, uh, but you can't look at the contents. This was the Snowden problem. He was a SharePoint admin. He needed to be create these sites, set up ACLs, etc. Giving them access to the documents was the fatal flaw. I mean, that was just a disaster. So yeah, the big difference between being able to do management and being able to actually see the contents. And with GIA, you can easily configure environments like that. Okay. So that's the heart of it. And now I'm going to go into some of the, the, the 400 <laughs> level stuff, right? And in particular, I'm going to tell you about some of the challenges that I had and having and are, are addressing as part of this. Okay, so lots of stepped on a number of rakes here. So first is that a lot of the technology that we're using here was all the technology that underlying technology that Exchange we developed with Exchange to support Exchange Online. I mean, think about Exchange Online, right? All of Exchange requires admin privileges to do things like add mailboxes and, and such. So how do they then take those functions which require admin privileges and give it to the whole internet, right? Do you ever think about that? Like, how the heck did they do that? And the answer is we work closely with them to build this technology that allowed them to do that. Now they do that with uh, using IIS and hosted WinRM. And what I'm doing is I'm taking those same techniques and I'm going to use them uh, in a different use case. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with our back model for exchange and how they do that. But uh, so that's, is that going to be a challenge as well? That a lot of Once they do, then they're going to be familiar with uh, that whole model that Exchange has rolled out with, with roles, and you have assignments, and you have en entries. I mean, basically, yeah, the question is, uh, everything you've done, but not in BSC. Exchange, Exchange has a very rich RBAC system, 
in fact, and the question is, how are is this going to get conf are people going to get so used to that that they're going to have a problem adopting this? Can you get in and, and, and supersede it with this so that they before people start getting adapted. To that? I don't think it's an either or. It definitely is not an either or. In fact, Exchange went and did this initial used these techniques initially, and then have extended that with by modifying their commands to better support uh, RBAC. I recently spoke to a, a group of uh, academic uh, security researchers, and as I was describing this, one of the researchers said, oh, isn't this just our back and least privilege? And I said, yes and no. Yes, it's true, but how many people are, are actively, you know, consider themselves having successful RBAC implementations, right? Yeah, in a room this size is typically a couple folks. Most folks, uh, uh, what we're bringing to the table are two concepts, really. One is just simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. I believe that the model is simple enough that people can actually deploy it and be successful with it. Again, back to RBAC, a lot of people, it sounds great, but then you go implement it, you have more groups than you have users, it becomes incoherent, people don't really know. It, in the end, it's very complex and people have not been as successful as we would like them to be with it. We think this is simple and can be implemented. Exactly. And then the second thing that we're bringing to the picture that's, that's novel is this notion of the fine-grained proxies that PowerShell allows you to do. So that's really the, the, the point there. So originally I tried to do this with configuration files. Configuration files did not work. I wasted a lot of time on configuration files. I'm not entirely sure what they are particularly good for, but I can tell you not this level of control. Uh, so I ended up having to use startup scripts instead. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to end up doing is to, what I'd like to do is to have a common startup script that then uh, uses, a, uses configuration files to drive a common startup script, but processes the things the way I want to. When I create these admin credentials and then set up a, a run as endpoint for uh, a WinRM, anytime you add something to WinRM, remove something from WinRM or change something for WinRM, you have to restart WinRM to make it so. So, that, and, and anyone that's been, is connected and doing work gets, gets uh, affected by that. So that's a real problem. That's I, had, a, I had the wrong question. The startup script, what do you mean exactly with the startup script? We're going to show you. Oh. I'll get into all the details. So that was a real problem. Now, and one of the big problems was if um, you use desired state configuration, so desired state configuration, you're using WSMAN to talk to WMI, which is talking to something. If that something tries to restart WinRM, uh, you get it into what's called a stop pending state, which means reboot your computer because it ain't coming back, my friend. Uh, well, that's a bug. We fixed that bug. Um, but in general, we still have to restart more than we should, and that's a, something we'll be working on. Uh, these proxies, uh, proxy commandlets, uh, were generating names which were unqualified names, uh, and so that wasn't specific enough, so we've uh, modified that. Now when you generate a, a qualified name, show you what that looks like. Yeah, so this is a proxy commandlet, and notice here we're going to do a X We're going to do an execution context, invoke command, get command, and notice it now gives a fully qualified name, right? So if you know, I don't know if you know this, stop process. A lot of people, by the way, a lot of people are really like, oh, down on aliases. Oh, you shouldn't use alias in production scripts because it's not, you know, aliases can change. Most of the things you put in scripts can change. I'm not so hardcore on this, don't use aliases. Because it turns out, stop process is not what you think it is. Stop process is in fact an alias. The real commandlet is this, Microsoft PowerShell management slash stop process. If you specify that string, then you got something that's well-defined hardcore. If you just specify stop process, you can, here I'll prove it to you. <laughs> stop process minus name notepad minus what if. Oh, okay, whatever. Okay, couldn't find that. Okay, but but there, you know, solid. I didn't use an alias. You use stop process, right? Okay, function stop. Hmm. 
<laughs> okay, so <laughs> anyway, so uh, these are not real strong names. That, the one I showed you before was a real strong name. Anyway, so we weren't using those strong names, and, and now we are. Um, when we do logging, okay, so we're going to log everything. Um, we were logging things as the connected user, not who got logged in. So if you've ever run PowerShell, let's see, let's see, enter PS session. Let's do, let me see if I got this. Here we go. So I've got another run as where I can do anything. How many people are familiar with PS sender info? Anybody? Oh, this is really cool. So there's a commandlet. Sorry, there's a go. There is PS sender info. There is a variable PS sender info, and it's got all sorts of great stuff. You know, we notice we have the the time zone the client came in in the connection string, uh, but we have I came in as NTDev J Snover. That's my connected user, and the run as user is a local admin account. Okay, so when we were doing logging, we were always logging things using the who, who's actually running things, which in the case of this, in GIA, I'm going to have all you people, because I trust you all, I'm going to take away your admin privileges, that's why I trust you, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to be access to this environment uh, where you can do a limited set of things. But I still want to know who did it, and when we were only logging things as the run as user, I lost that information. So now we're going to be able to log both, right? The run as and, and who we came in as. Um, and there's currently no way to find out what <coughs> endpoint someone came in as. So here, notice, what I really like to know is which endpoint, which, which configuration name did you come in as? Because then um, what I want to do is I want to have an initial startup, a same startup <coughs> script for everyone, use that startup script to look at this data structure to find out what endpoint did they come in on, use that name to then find the configuration file, and then handcraft the environment. Currently, I can't do that. Currently, I have to have a unique startup script for each machine. That's just the, or each endpoint. And that's the wrong design. Show command. If you're familiar with show command, wonderful thing. Notice it's it's dis disabled. Why? Show command does not work in a remote session. Now, as I talked to a number of the IT guys, they said they talked about this, and they said, "Wait, so th does this mean?" I can't use my GUIs? I said, that's correct. You can't use your GUIs unless your GUIs are written on top of PowerShell uh, and connect to a, and can control what configuration name they can config connect to. Other than that, you use PowerShell. And they said, well, I'm pretty sure I actually like PowerShell. I, I think I can succeed with that. But the other guys in my team, I don't know about them. Uh, what we would, I showed them then show command. I said, well, what if show command showed them only the commands they could do and only the parameters. And they were all convinced, yeah, if we had that, they could be successful. So we're going to modify show command so that it will work against remote uh, sessions and be able to show you just the commands you have and just the, the parameters you have. By the way, it turns out you know, all these things, um, Exchange doesn't, didn't do with any of these things, right? Because they wrote their own GUI. They had a well-defined scenario. So we have a very strong security feature. It's just as we take that security feature and try and put it into a scenario, uh, problems that these, like these popped up. Turns out that uh, the no language endpoints are great programmatically, but interactively they lack some support necessary to make it a good, rich, uh, interactive experience. Um, turns out that when you, we can say, oh, you can generate these toolkits, um, we have what Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard called the dizziness of freedom. Good Lord, where do I start? And so what's going to be required to be successful is we're going to have to generate those first set of toolkits for everyone to, to use, and then they can look at them and say, oh, that's not quite right, and modify it. But we'll have to generate those toolkits. And I'm rewriting everything now using desired state configuration classes. So I've got a GN.2. I'll show you that. And, it, and by the way, and part of the reason for that was to then really stress test the desired state configuration class implementations, and we'll find lots of great things from that process. Okay, oh, sorry. All right, so here's the heart of the configuration, uh, the constrained run space. So you get a credential, right? In this case, the credential is a 
um, a local account, you know, local admin account. You then register that, you give it a name, you say show security to script UI to set the ACL. We have the startup script, and then you use that credential that you just got. And then when you do an enter PS session, you do it the way you normally do, but you now specify this configuration name. And now somebody that has, you know, you give this this ACL, you give rights to a group that of people that aren't in domain, aren't admins, admins, they're able to access this, they run as that credential, and then the commands that you made available then run as admin. So here's the heart of it. Yes. A good question. Um, the startup script, does that run as the run as user, or does it run as system, or what does it run as? It, I believe it runs as the run as user. Yeah. It does. Okay, so here's the heart of it. In the startup script, you can do anything, right? Your creativity, you're limited only by your creativity. The heart, the most important thing you must do is you must set the uh, language mode. And t you have to set it to no language mode, okay? <coughs> no language mode says I can perform operations, run commands, but I can't um, do any language elements. I can't access methods. I can't uh, access properties. Most importantly, I can't access, I can't define new functions, okay? Because if you recall, uh, well, we'll explain it more, but basically, if I can define a function, I can get around all the security barriers. Okay, here you want to control what can be loaded and, and seen. So there's execution context to something called session state. And here, let's just show you that. So dollar sign SS, oh, sorry, exit. This is the session state for your execution context. And notice we have things like applications and scripts. Okay? This defines what applications and script you can run. And notice it says star here. Okay? So if I go and I say um, ping, right? Ping is a Win32 executable. Actually, let me grab the information for ping here a second. So I can say ping. That works, okay. Uh, but if I say sign ss dot applications dot clear, and I try and do that again, it won't, okay. So we can control what things you can see and you can not see. Now, if you want to, remember I grabbed the information for ping here, and there's its source. If you want to, you can add things back specifically. So I can say dollar sign p dot source. You have to give the full path name. And now, I can run ping, but I can't run any of the other things. IP config, nope, won't run. So by default, it's star. You can control everything, or you can run everything. You want to clear that out and give explicit control by giving the full path name to the specific things you want them to be able to do. You can do that for scripts. Ten minutes if you can. OK. Scripts, here's your edit. And then you, you control things through visibility. Okay, now visibility, this is the heart of PowerShell, right? The heart of the security layer is we control what things can be invoked versus what things can be run. That's the distinction. Hold that in your mind. I'll explain it a bit. But it's invoking versus running. Okay, so then you'll want to set up logging. Logging we've had for quite a while. You just, on every module, there's a value, log pipeline execution details. You set that to true. We will log all the script executions. Here's what that looks like. So if somebody types GPS, NO, star, CA, star, SPSS, what the heck was that? We actually log all the details, who is running, et cetera. And then down here, hey, that map to get process, and this positional parameter map to the name, and the values NO and CA. Hmm. Still know what that is. Well, that then got piped to SPSS. SPS, SP, SPPS got mapped to stop process, who then bound the input object to system diagnostic process calc and notepad. So we've had very rich logging. So good stuff. And this is how you set it up in your startup script. And in the startup script, you can do anything else. Again, you're limited by your imagination. Okay? So you can grab that sender 
connected info and he can send mail message to his boss saying, hey, this person logged in, here are the things they were doing. Turns out this is important and we're gonna have this. We're gonna have, one of the things is I, again, security that's not deployed is not secure. So as I talk to people about this, they're like, yeah, yeah, it's really cool, but if I'm ever in a situation where I can't get my job done, that's complete fail. I'm gonna get fired. So I'm very nervous about this. And so the way we're gonna address that is we're gonna have a break the glass endpoint. A break the glass endpoint will allow these, again, authorized people to come in, do run as, but then they can do anything they want, okay? But I'm gonna log everything that they do, and I'm gonna tell their boss, hey, here's what they did, and uh, then you can have a conversation. So as long as your actions are justified, just be aware it's gonna be monitored. And that's a nice balance. People thought, oh, okay, great, then we can, we can do that. And often then what you wanna do is you just wanna say, well, why did you have to do that? Oh, well, I really needed this command and it wasn't there. Oh, okay, well, let's put that there and then don't do that anymore. Okay, fine. So you use that to kind of get feedback on whether you've got your toolbox definition set up correctly. So in this case, you could also make a logon banner so they know that they're being logged. Absolutely. You, you mentioned, yeah, you want to have a logon banner telling them that it's being logged and sent to his, his boss. That's exactly correct. Again, you can do anything. And so one of the things you can do is you can find out what day of the week it is. And you can say, hey, if it's Saturday or Sunday, go home. You know, you know, <laughs> like, why are you doing things when you're not supposed to be doing things? Right? So you can control things like that. Um, so the question: If you are, um, if your admins are sort of a, a little bit savvy and know how to use all of like the run space classes inside, is it going to be smart enough to um, to be able to see inside that? Or if you create like a, a script block, a script block, block um, create using commands that you're not allowed, and then the, use the .NET method invoke on the script block object, is it going to be able to see inside that? And yeah, no, I'm teaching you the things you need to do to make it a security layer. If you do these things, it's a secure layer. If you don't do these things, it's not a secure layer. Again, the most important is the no language mode. Okay, so here, let me, let me hold off on the questions. So we can, okay, so the heart of this is, is these creating the proxies. So as you know, PowerShell, the key thing about PowerShell is we own the parser. That's different than the other environments. Uh, the other environments, when you say ping, they resolve to an, a, an executable and then give all the arguments to that. We don't do that. We control the arguments. So we'll take that and we'll parse the executable, parse those things. Now the point of that is that, that the parser is driven off data and that data is programmable. So here what we do is you get command, well actually let's just show you. So if you get command for stop process, you've seen that, right? You see that all the time. But if you take that object and you pass it and you create a command metadata, then you get a metadata object and this is the programmable object, okay? So notice it has parameters. Metadata parameters should add them. Oh, I, I renamed the damn thing, didn't I? God damn it. <laughs> Let's see how I'm gonna do this. Uh, oh, well, there you, there's the answer. What the heck was it? Microsoft dot power. Thank you. So you remember I was telling you it, it, it's not real? It's not, that's just another flavor of an alias? Okay, there. Let's try that. Okay, so now when I ask for the parameters. There we go, there are my parameters, okay? So here are the parameters, and you know, you can stop process by name, ID, et cetera. But this parameters, I can do things like remove ID. And now look, it's gone. Okay, so now you cannot remove things by ID. Okay, here, what I'll do is I'm gonna take the, the name attribute, and I'm gonna add a validate set, saying you can only delete things whose names are uh, notepad or calc. I set the default value. This is the way you say I have a command proxy and I'm going to create a new proxy based upon this metadata. And then I'm going to assign it to stop process. OK. 
Okay. So now when I say stop process, stop process minus name LSASS, find out, and it won't. It says, hey, you can't name LSASS does not belong to the set, notepad or calc. Okay, so I've generated a proxy. So secure or not secure? Secure. Yeah. Uh, not secure. Why is it not secure? Remember I said hold on to this concept between invoking things and running it. Okay? At this point I have two things. Both of them can be invoked, both of them can be run. What are my two things? Get command, stop process. One thing? No. That's all. Two things. I have a function stop process and I have a commandlet stop process. I can invoke and run either one of them. So if I just run stop process, doesn't work. But if I run Microsoft.PowerShell.Management management stop process, it says, oh, are you sure you want to do that? And I will hopefully say no. No, good, okay, good, thank God. Now, now, here's the critical step, the critical step. I take that original command, right, and I set its visibility, vis visibility to private, okay? Now, making it private means it can be run, but it cannot be invoked. Why do we still have to run it? Because the proxy commandlet's not doing anything. All it's doing is it's calling this commandlet. So that commandlet still needs to be able to be run. I just need to keep users from invoking it. Because if they invoke it, they can do anything they want. So I create the proxies. Users can invoke the proxy. That's all they can invoke. But they can run either one. And so, back to this. Here is the proxy. I run it. I invoke it and I can run it. Here is the explicit thing, not for both, let's say what if <laughs> instead. Um, I try and invoke it and now it says, I don't even know what you're talking about because we hit it. So that's the key thing, you have to make these things private. Otherwise you don't have security. What was the other thing I said? If you don't do this, you have no security at all. You gotta remember this one the language mode. You have to change the language mode. We are now in full language. Two plus two. Say again? Are you thinking about making that as the default for all uh, endpoints? No. no. Nope. So, so here, execution context dot language dot, what the heck's the name of it? I forgot the language oh. mode. Where do we put the language Session mode? Space. Session. Session state dot language mode. Language mode. Okay, it's full language. Now, why? Remember I just did this and it doesn't work? Imagine I do this. Function. That's a new verb, by the way. <laughs> so what did I say? This can be run, it can't be invoked. So when I try to invoke it, it said, no, you can't invoke it. If I have a language mode, full language mode, I can define new functions. I can invoke this function, and it can run this. So I can't run this, but I can invoke that, and that can run it. Jeffrey, uh, wrap it up like real, real quick. <laughs> OK, so that's it. Admins are part of the attack surface. That's the key thing, right? Key thing. So, this PowerShell GIA is all about incrementally reducing the risk associated with admins. This is not a binary thing. This is not get rid of admins. This is if you have ten people with tens of thousands of people with admin privs, let's get that down to thousands. If you have thousands, let's get it to hundreds. If you have hundreds, let's get it to tens. If you have tens, let's get it to single digits. Let's reduce the number of people with admin privileges. Let's reduce the impact of those people that have admin privileges. Let's reduce what can be done when we give those as admin privileges. 
and let's log everything. We have three simple concepts. This toolkit. The toolkit defines a set of actions to perform a set of tasks. We have an endpoint. An endpoint allows authorized people to get provisioned to access these toolkits that are then going to run as a GIA endpoint account, an account that has local admin privileges. And then we have this GIA endpoint account, the thing that has the local admin privileges. So back to our, our, our Michael Hayden. At Black Hat 2010, he did a keynote address. And this is when everybody's finding out about the, the Chinese all in their enterprise, like back doors, domain rights, just like, oh my God, what's going on? And somebody said, turned to this, him and he said, what do we do about all these attacks? And Michael Hayden said, man up and defend yourself. Key message here, there is no backstop. There's no backstop. The government's not going to protect you. The government's not going to build a moat. The government's not going to put a smart bomb down the Chinese hacker's uh, building. None of that's going to happen. <coughs> the only way you're going to protect yourself is by you protecting yourself. So GIA is a toolkit that helps you protect yourself. It's a toolkit that allows PowerShell, uses PowerShell role-based administration to secure this new post-Snowden world, this a world where we realize that admins are part of the attack surface, so how do we reduce the, the, the damage there? And we don't have time for questions. <laughs> And the button. And the button. There you go. Uh, so, what'd you think? Good week?